Good morning to you. I'm Mike Miano, pastor of the Blue Point Bible Church, director of the Power of Preterism Network, and this is one of our ministries that we provide. This is the Preterist Power Hour. We endeavor to go live every day for an hour where we talk about the power of the theology of preterism, the power that it's bringing into different communities and churches uh, in regards to its advancement, and uh, we hope that our time together is edifying to you. Uh, good morning, Edward. I want to go ahead and encourage you to go ahead and share your, your opening thoughts and lead us in a word of prayer, if you don't mind. Yes, good morning. My <clears throat> name is Edward Howell. I'm a member of the Blue Point Bible Church, also a board member of the Power Predators of Network. And uh, I welcome all of you viewers, and I uh, hope to, hopefully everyone will be empowered. Now I'd like to open us up in prayer. Heavenly Father, please go before us. Give us clarity of mind, thought, and proper focus that we may present today with clarity, information that will cause thinking, uh, proving all things, and that it will provoke conversation and develop fellowship in the lives of those that are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, brother, it's Wisdom Wednesday. I hope that uh, each of us endeavor to lean into some wisdom today uh, in regards to, now let's qualify what wisdom is. Knowledge is information, right? You're gain, you know something. Uh, wisdom would be beginning to find ways that you can implement that, uh, that, that knowledge. And then of course, uh, understanding is showing that you have done that. It's demonstrating both. It's demonstrating you have the knowledge and you've implemented it correctly. You've gained an understanding. So wisdom would be how can we use the knowledge that we have? How can we have, as one uh, man had taught me years ago, a wise dome? Uh, you know, talking about your head as a dome there. Uh, how can we have a wise dome? And uh, here we are with the Preterist Power Hour. So I believe it's important to uh, share highlights and thoughts and teachings, quotes, if you will, that highlight the power of preterism. Just this morning, Dr. Cindy Coates, we've had her here as a guest on our program. She has a podcast called Present Truth Matters that you can find on iTunes. And just this morning, she shared this quote, the church, the body of Christ, the new Jerusalem has no last days and no end times. We are past all of that. That's in the past. And uh, I praise God for that knowledge, and of course, I pray that even some of the things we shared yesterday in regards to the kingdom of God, uh, things we shared in regards to review of the Rethinking the Resurrection Conference, I pray that it, that knowledge causes us to live with wisdom, to, to truly put forth uh, what I call oftentimes a zeal empowered by knowledge. Uh, you know, we live lives that reflect that. So, uh, Edward, do you have any wisdom uh, thoughts or uh, wise dome thoughts that you want to share with us this morning? Sure. I, I believe when we come to the understanding that we're in the new covenant that has no end, we're living in the, you know, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly kingdom, we don't want to look towards a ca catastrophic end when, there, when we should be living in the fulfilled you know, uh, abundant life that Christ has uh, given us. Right. You know, what's, what's ahead of us should be, you know, uh, peace, joy, and what is it? Uh, righteousness, peace. peace, and joy. Yes, righteousness, peace, and joy. This is what we should be, you know, uh, holding on to and growing in, you know, instead of looking towards a catastrophic end where we're in the kingdom and there, that has no end. That's right. That's right. The ever-increasing kingdom that we read about in Isaiah 9, the government that's upon Christ's shoulders, that son's shoulders. So amen, brother. I appreciate that. I, um, I agree with you. I, I think it's important. We see in scripture, uh, it's important what we set our minds on. Right, we see in Philippians four eight, set your mind on things above. Colossians, I believe it's Colossians three two, uh, beautiful text that tell us that it's you know highlight that it's important what we're setting our minds on. There's so much to think about, so much to look at, especially in our contemporary culture. There's so much for us to uh, set our eyes upon, you know, and it's important for us to uh, find that we're doing that rightly. Uh, if you want righteousness, peace, and joy, we need to seek those things out. Uh, matter of fact, the proverb I used to always recite was uh, seek peace and pursue it. I think that's the reality, that if you seek it and you pursue it, 
there'll be more for it to be found. You know, uh, matter of fact, uh, that reminds me of a quote I just saw the other day on the road. It was, um, let me see if I can dig it up here. I, th I think I shared it on social media, but it was just, here I am on the road, you know, just journeying toward my next destination for almost a week. And this, this picture was on the Starbucks sign. And I had to, you know, I, I walked up to it. I took a picture of it because it was just a, such a, an important thought. This is what it is. The longer you practice patience, the shorter the wait for relief is. If you think about it, that's the whole point of patience uh, to gain, you know, you're, you're working toward an end. So I think about that when we're talking about peace and, and what we're setting our eyes on. For many people, they're going to say, well, Edward, there's nothing peaceful to set my eye on. And then I say, well, go ahead. And I mean, that's obviously erroneous. Uh, however, God's beautiful creation always has things that we could set our eyes upon um, that would bring forth righteousness, peace, and joy. I believe that's a part of his faithful promise, if you will. However, um, one of the easier ways that you could do it is go do it yourself. You know, criticize by creating. If you don't see peace, make peace. And then you'll see it. It, it, it seems so, it makes sense to me. You know, and that actually what that runs against. Uh, sorry, you're going to say something, Edward? No, I was just going to say, you know, uh, piggyback on what you were saying is that it's our responsibility, you know, to make things happen because we are in a war against principalities and powers and all of these things. So therefore, you know, if we want something, we have to make it happen, you know, and th that's the way that is in that regard. That's right. We, we need to criticize, again, to use that quote, and I don't want to use and abuse it, but it makes so much sense to me. It does. Uh, criticize by creating. And I would say that what this runs against uh, is that uh, one of the things I appreciate uh, Richard had brought up weeks ago when we talked about uh, Gog and Magog and a lot of that uh, conversation there is that the future of you had this, uh, this need, a necessary need for war, for the antithetical reality of peace. And unfortunately, uh, futurist theology, futurist ethic leads toward that. You know, just this week, obviously, I've been focusing a lot on uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And namely, uh, the, the, the three evils, if you will, that he marked out, militarism, nationalism, and racism. And when you look at what the futurist view in, in many different of the uh, ologies, if you will, you know, whether it's dispensationalism, whether it's uh, you know, partial preterism with replacement theology, whatever it might be, uh, these views all f kind of bring together the need for a nationalist mentality among somebody, whether it's the church with theonomy, whether it's the uh, nation of Israel with dispensationalism or America, um, you know, all these different uh, reformed churches, very, you know, guilty of that a lot of times, uh, overemphasizing America's role, uh, conservative values in, in American politics in scripture. And a lot of this, you know, leads to nationalism. And then you have, of course, militarism, war, you know, that, that's going to be the need. If you read, if we're going to head toward an end times, um, everywhere I read about the coming of the Lord, it illustrates war is going to happen. So it'd become like a necessary issue. Um, and then, of course, racism, where dispensationalism highlights, you know, the, the Jews being this elite people uh, to the, uh, you know, to the demise, if you will, uh, to of the uh the palestinian people and you know there's just so much there um that you know and then we see there's all kinds of the uh, groups that build their theologies their racist theologies off of uh certain erroneous views of eschatology uh and of theology so getting this right actually is is a big deal if we want to see righteousness peace and joy uh in our world in our lives in our teachings uh, we really do need to uh have a good handle on what we're saying about the last days, about the end times. And that's why I love what Cindy Coates had mentioned there, that our reality is that there are no last days and end times to what we know as the ever-increasing kingdom of God. That's why I love the Blue Point Bible Church so much, being that we're a thinking faith and, and we're a Bible church. Because if, if, they, if people were to understand scripture, they would understand that Jesus Christ broke down the barriers of, you know, of racism and, and all that follows in every guy. That's so, right. you know, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, and we're to treat each other as such, you know, especially if you were to treat one greater than yourself, mm -hmm. you know, 
uh, it would it would it would help so much with the with the love you know that we need to express to one another instead of hate. That's right. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Absolutely, you know. Again, it has a lot to do with it. You know, the the theology and eschatology has a lot to do with, uh, you know, what we're what we're saying about racism, about militarism, and about um, nationalism. So. Um, so again, I, I just wanted to highlight, I love that quote by Dr. Cindy Coates, you know, talking about the kingdom of God, uh, there's a brother I had reached out to, uh, Alvin Dixon. He spoke at the, uh, the conference I went to the rethinking the resurrection conference. And I shared my notes. I want to remind everyone, go to powerofpreterism.wordpress.com. You can listen to the lectures there and you can also uh, gain access through my notes. And I broke them down into pieces. So if you click on the numbers on the, on the screen there on the blog, it'll take you to the YouTube uh, that, that moment in the YouTube session, so you can listen to the different segments uh, at your own will. And uh, Alvin Dixon, you know, he sat in front of me, I mentioned him the other day. Uh, he sat in front of me uh, during the conference. He had reached out to me prior to the conference and let me know, you know, he had uh, watched some of our teachings, was looking forward to meeting me. I know he watched quite a few of Glenn's, uh, Glenn Hill's messages at the Blue Point Bible Church. So he was somewhat familiar with me going up there, introducing our speakers and so forth. So I was excited to meet him as well. And uh, so I, you know, there we are at the conference. He's sitting in front of me and he has this nature about him where you can tell there's so much going on in his mind. You talk about someone that set their mind upon the scriptures and has, you know, he's constantly meditating and thinking through the things of the scriptures. Alvin's that guy, you know, he's the man that he's going to be listening and he's developing like five other analogies for what you're saying to build upon, you know, a kingdom reality. And uh, if you go to the power of preterism site, I shared, you know, some of the thoughts he uh, posted. If you give me one second, I'm going to bring my screen over there. And um, obviously he started out his message talking about the better resurrection. And he said, the better resurrection is not something over yonder, you know, over there. I remember as a little kid, I used to go to North Carolina with my family. And I remember the first time I heard somebody say over yonder. And I looked so confused, you know, here I am, I'm from the North, you know, that's not our way of speaking. And he said over yonder. And I remember, I was so confused. I was like, where is he saying it is? And, and my aunt said, well, it's over there. You know, it's not here, it's over there. So what Alvin is essentially saying is the contrary. Better is not over yonder. We have it right now, it's right here. And obviously we know that's having Christ, Christ in our lives. Christ said, I am the resurrection and the life. It doesn't get much more clearer than that. So Alvin, you know, starting out, I love when we start out with simplicity. Let's highlight what it is. This is what we're saying. Resurrection is what we have in Christ. He went on to talk about how the word Hebrew means the other side. You know, we, the Hebrews crossed over to the other side. And then the goal of the old covenant, new covenant transition was to cross over to the other side, you see, to, uh, that's that's the better resurrection to cross over we've crossed over from sin to life from death to life jesus said if you believe in me you've passed from death to life you've went to the other side and uh then alvin basically what i appreciated in his presentation was he went on to talk about how it's one thing to bless the preaching of the word of god and he talked about how a lot of time in southern churches uh, people will say, you know, the preacher will be pre preaching and they'll say, bless you, bless you, you know, bless you, Lord. And they'll kind of, that's a big Southern church type of mentality there. And he said, it's one thing to bless the preaching, but God blesses the hearers of the word. And obviously we know not just the hearers, but the doers, uh, which we read in James. So uh, Alvin said, let those who have ears hear. And the whole point of all of that was to say that the only way you're going to know what resurrection truly is and identify with what we're saying is to experience it. And you know, Edward, we can appreciate that because being that we understand sovereign grace, we understand that those that are going to understand these things are those that are blessed with the spirit of God. Uh, the, you know, first Corinthians chapter two, the natural man does not understand the things of God. These things are made known through the spirit. And uh, so Alvin, you know, really leaned in on that there and highlighted that, you know, part of understanding resurrection part of experiencing resurrection is you have to judge yourselves you have to judge yourself lest you be judged uh, we see in first corinthians 11 as i highlighted this past sunday um probably you know let me say this uh, this was an outflow of some of the conversation that i enjoyed with alvin not just his sermon but also you know just having that personal fellowship and you know learning from a man that is constantly meditating upon the things of god 
And he, uh, he, this past Sunday, I mentioned that if we judge ourselves, first Corinthians 11 31 says that if we judge ourselves rightly, then we, we will not need to be judged. And, and that's, that's sort of the mentality that uh, Alvin was going on with was that if we've experienced resurrection and we've died to ourselves so that we might have life, what the apostle Paul says, right? I, I, it's not me who lives. I've crucified, I'm crucified with Christ so that Christ who lives through me. Well, then the only way that we're going to understand resurrection is to die to ourselves and experience life through Christ. And this comes with a very necessary point of judging ourselves. Uh, again, we see the contrast. The, the, the Christians in the first century, they judged thousands of years of tradition wrong. They were willing to admit that it was wrong. So, you know, they understood what Christ said in, in the book, Gospel of Mark. We read that uh, Jesus says, by your traditions, you have invalidated the word of God, speaking to the Pharisees. So there were Jews that were willing to say, you know, we were wrong. We're wrong and acknowledge that. Die to themselves. Lean not on their own understanding. And were able to judge themselves rightly so that they would listen to the Savior. Whereas the contrast was who? Those that did not judge themselves rightly. And then what happened? The wrath of God. They did not experience resurrection uh, in, in that sense because they did not die to themselves. So hopefully you're seeing what I'm saying there, Edward, and I hope that's beneficial. Uh, and what I see also in that is that to experience the resurrection power, Jesus has given us a, a very good way of doing so, being that uh, God uh, uh, would have us to give our offering through the uh, praise of sacrifice, the mm -hmm. praise of sacrifice through our lips. And by doing so, uh, by praising God for the small things, uh, the times that we're in the valley mm -hmm. and uh, God is with us. And by us recognizing these things and giving God praise, you know, we're actually inadvertently experiencing the resurrection power of God because, you know, we're being renewed, we're being strengthened. And by recognizing this, our faith begins to develop. When you praise God in these instances by seeing his hand in things, you know, you're actually experiencing these things. And you grow and you develop it. The more you praise God for, for the things that he's done, for the things that he's doing, for being with you through all of, the, all of these times, the good, bad, the ugly, you know, uh, your relationship is being developed and growing with God. You know, you're growing near to him and he's growing near to you. That's right. Amen. You know, just this morning, Shonda had shared a, a text that, you know, sometimes frustrates me when people post it, uh, Jeremiah 29, 11. And, you know, that's the verse where a lot of us uh, focus on, you know, God has plans to prosper you, to uh, give you peace. Uh, just to paraphrase it there. Um, these are my thoughts for you, is what the Lord says. Uh, for these are my thoughts, thoughts of plans to prosper you, thoughts of peace, uh, not to your end, you know, etc. So a lot of you see that, po that quote posted everywhere on, you know, all sorts of signs. I've seen people, uh, I've heard people unfortunately erroneously use that text uh, as a sort of prosperity text. And the reason I bring this up is because as what you just said, that verse, that chapter, Jeremiah chapter 29 is highlighting that what the Lord is going to do is bring his people into the uh, bondage under the Babylonians for 70 years. But what he's telling them is, is this is not to your end. I'm not bringing this upon you to destroy you. I'm bringing this upon you for your benefit. So you're going to struggle, but I have plans to give you peace and to prosper you. So you see how that beautifully illustrates what you, you were just saying, Edward. And uh, that's so important for us to know that, you know, uh, it's not the ATM God. It's not the God that, you know, uh, is going to be there, uh, you know, to, to constantly bless you. It's the God that loves you, the God that's going to chastise you, the God that's going to prune you, the God that's going to lead you through things that are going to build you up. But they're first going to break you down. That's why death to self is that first and foremost necessity of experiencing resurrection. And in refining gold, you know, is refined through fire. That's right. That's right. That was one of my first, you know, Bible lessons, if you will, was uh, learning about the iron furnace of Egypt and what the Lord was doing for his people by, you know, uh, again, Egypt was understood to be the iron furnace, the iron furnace of, you know, of punishment. And uh, but what happens, you know, you burn the, the impurities off, you burn, you refine your people. So, uh, yeah, that's a uh, beautiful truths, brother. Uh, wis there's wisdom in that, you know. Um, I did want to mention, so uh, there's the last point I kind of want to bring up about Alvin, and I was hoping he may end up calling in, but uh, he may have, have had something else to do. I know he 
views our program. So I'm excited for that. And uh, when we do find time and ability to get him here on the program, we're going to welcome that. Uh, as I've mentioned, I'm hoping to have uh, those that spoke at the uh, conference on the program. So I know I've reached out to Reese Maggard. We're going to have Reese Maggard on the program next week. Glenn Hill, I'm going to still be reaching out to him, try to schedule him for next week. Uh, I've reached out to Scott Laughlin. I haven't heard back from him yet. And then, of course, Jonathan Butchery will be joining us um, on Friday. But I have some announcements I'm going to bring up about Jonathan in a moment. So I don't want to go too far into that just yet. Going back to Alvin. Uh, Alvin, one of the things I appreciated about him, uh, there were so many things, you know, I could go on and on. Uh, however, uh, one of the other things was his kingdom minded mentality. He's the one that will take a truth, a simple truth from scripture, meditate upon it, and then bring out something that you would have never thought about. And, and, and it's like, wow, that rings so true. He had offered up an illustration. I don't want to butcher it, so I'm going to leave it alone. But he offered up an illustration about a door and the law and the prophets, like a door hinge. And then we were talking about Passover with the blood being wiped on the mantle. And he brought up kind of the gospel, the law and the prophets holding up the door hinge and a sort of analogy in that regard that if you there's things you can't see, there's things you can see. You know, a door hinge doesn't make much sense uh, when you just look at it and, and fail to realize that there's other pieces to the door uh, that are behind that wall that you can't see. You know, so there's just it was a really good analogy. I don't want to butcher it. But one I will bring up that I thought was great was if you want to go with me, uh, Edward, I don't know if you have a hard copy of the Bible. I'm going to bring my attention our attention over to. Revelation chapter 21. And uh, those of you that know my ministry know I often talk about a Revelation 21 through 22 mentality or reality uh, that I believe that's our, our, the new temp, new covenant reality, what we're currently living in. And you'll understand why I appreciated this so much. So Alvin at the conference brings up the text here in Revelation 21 verse 18. Obviously here we're talking about this new Jerusalem that came out of heaven from God. And uh, notice in verse 18, it says, and the material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. How do you picture this, Edward? What do you picture pure gold, but clear like glass? What, does anything come to mind for you? How would you mentally picture what well, that's pure gold? That means it's been refined through the fire. Right. And clear glass is being, you know, uh, uh, transparent in a sense. Uh, right. Okay. So then, and again, what I'm, I'm, there's sort of a paradox. It, it's a paradox. I don't know that too many people uh, would read this and understand what Brother Alvin brought out. However, I have to say, I have to give uh, kudos to Mike Ferris. The minute I said this to him, I don't know if it was what we were talking about. I remember we were standing by a window there, so that may have been the clue. Uh, however, he got it right away, and he said, it's mirrored glass. If you think about it, it's gold, so it's dark on one side where you can't see out, or you can't mm -hmm. see in, but it's mirrored, so it's clear on one side, as you're pointing out, transparent, that you can see out. So if you've ever seen mirrored glass, you can see in one side, but you can't see out the yeah. other. Yeah. So now catch this. Catch the significance of this. So this is talking about the kingdom of God. Right. The kingdom of God, the, the city is pure like gold and clear like glass. Alvin Dixon says this. That's because we in the in the kingdom can see the kingdom and we can see outside. But those outside cannot see in. And I was like, Edward, if you only wow. knew. Wow. Like, yes, that is. A, that I was like, that's is it. Those wow, wow moments. Yes. Yeah. I was like, wait a minute. That's it. So then the point is, that's why if you, you continue reading. What does it end up saying? It says there's a river of water, right? In chapter 22, uh, verse one, there's a river of water, clear as crystal coming from the throne, which is in that city. In the middle of the street, there's this tree. I'm going to paraphrase for a moment here. A tree that it brings forth fruit. Uh, the leaves of the tree are used for healing. We often talk about this as our lives, Jesus being the tree of life, the, the, you know, the gospel being the, the branches that in the, in the fruit uh, and our lives being the leaves that come out of the fruit of the gospel. And then it says his servants are in the city. They, you know, if you look at verse three, there's no longer any curse. The throne of God and his lamb shall be in it and his bond servants shall serve him. They shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. Uh, no longer there's, is there any night, et cetera. It goes on all of that. But then if you notice, there's at the end of it where I wanted to get to was there's a uh, verse 17 and the spirit and the bride say, come and let the one who hears say, come and let the one who is thirsty come 
like the one who wishes to take of the water of life without cost, but they can't see in. Amen. You have to bring them. We are that it's again, this is a teaching on evangelism here. We have to go out. We have to go out and to invite them in. You notice it says they can hear. Uh, those that have this ears to hear can hear. However, and they can be thirsty, but they can't see. It doesn't say, and let the one who sees the city journey toward it. They can't see the city. You have to have eyes to see and ears to hear. The ears at part, obviously, is talking about, in my estimation, the elect, those that can hear, uh, but they can't see. Yes. Because you're blind. And again, there was another teaching that was brought up at the conference that blessed me. I think I talked about this one uh, the other day. Um, what was it? Uh, the scales, scales that fell from Paul's eyes in the book of Job, I yeah. believe it's Job 41, you know, that scales are identified as pride. Mm -hmm. So man in his pride, if he doesn't die, catch, I'm going to wrap this whole point up here. Notice this. If man does not die to himself, as I talked about before, you know, you, you have to experience resurrection, but you have to experience death. And when you experience the death, then you experience the resurrection. And then now you have the, you have this life that you are able to offer to others. I forgot my point where I was going to go with that, but. About uh, pride. Oh, about pride. Right. So you've died to yourself. That's the pride. The scales have fallen off. So now you can see, the, you know, the city, whereas those that have not died to themselves and still have that pride of life uh, in there. And that's not to say that we've completely eliminated it. Let's be fair and transparent in that regard. That we're, we're, we all struggle with these things of, you know, the pride of life, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the uh, eyes, the things that we read about there in uh, First John. So these are things that I think all men are continue to battle with, all men and women uh, battle with on the planet. It's part of the wicked nature within man, but that's a topic for another time. Uh, however, hopefully you see the kingdom significance of this and what this is saying about the kingdom, what it is saying about a Revelation 21 through 22 reality, that there's those that can't see in. We can see them. We can see out. We can see the problem of the world, but we are compelled to go out there. We need to go out there and get them to come in and, and do it. I was going to say also in, in uh, Revelation 22, verse 3, where it says there will, uh, there will no longer be any curse. So for those people that, that are thinking God is angry with us, this, that, and the other, it says here clearly that God is, there's no more curse. You know, right. God is not angry with us. You That's know? right. Actually, you know, in the resurrection, we're no longer alienated from God. That's right. We uh, <laughs> we talked a little bit about the, at the church. Um, many people are familiar with the whole Jonathan Edwards, uh, sinners in the hands of an angry God, uh, overpopularized, unfortunately. Uh, then when I went to uh, the conference there, Brother Reese Maggard, he wrote a book called Sinners in the Hands of an, a Happy God. And um, that's uh, that obviously is illustrated through their theology. Uh, namely the, the view that uh, God is not angry with people. God is a happy God. Now, we talked about at our church, a distinction we might make is we would say uh, sinners in the hands of, or we might even say, let's say sa saints in the hands of, saints in the hands of a loving God. And you, Edward, were responsible for kind of highlighting that. Uh, that might be the way we would frame our understanding of God's nature, God's will, and God's purpose. Uh, saints in the hands of a loving God. And um, so, and, and what love entails, love is not only you know mushy mushy. You know, sometimes it takes correction. That's right, absolutely. Love's not always happy. <laughs> you know, uh, that's uh, I I uh, get to I get the privilege to uh, be involved in a four year old's life, and uh, you know, I know a part of loving him as an adult is sometimes not being happy. You know, with what he's doing. So uh, that's very important, and I think that's how God handles us. Again, we we, we just illustrated that with what we said about Jeremiah twenty nine. And, and, you know, God's will, the kingdom, the reality of the kingdom. So um, another text I want to bring up that, so Alvin, again, true to form, uh, Alvin um, message, I messaged Alvin last night, talked to him a little bit, invited him to join us on the program. And he, he messaged, he said this to me, and this is his style. He said, well, what do you think about a four square city? And obviously, if you go back to Revelation 21, uh, you, you do the reading there about the measurements of the city you end up with a perfect cube. And uh, that, that's kind of the, the way that the whole city works out. And uh, I said, well, I have no idea. You know, that's one of those things in, in Revelation. I never thought about this text, verse 18, with the gold and the clear glass. I had never saw that before. So obviously, I'd never really thought about the, the four square detail. And then he messaged me and he said, well, if you look into it, it actually means courageous and bold. 
So then I did a little bit of research myself. And if you really think, again, I could agree with that conclusion. However, another one that I saw that kind of stands out to me is that it has a sturdy foundation. When you think about a four square city, you think about it being a perfect cube, you can't knock over a cube because it's, it's solid. It's, it's, you know, that's yeah. so it, it's solid and sturdy. So it's built upon the right things. And again, we know Jesus offers that, you know, if you listen to his teachings and you put them into practice, Matthew chapter seven, that you are like the wise man who builds his house upon the rock. So uh, the kingdom of God, the, the new covenant is sturdy. It is, it, it's built upon the rock. It's a foundational city uh, that cannot be shaken when the storms come. So, uh, you know, just beautiful realities. I appreciate Brother Alvin. I do look forward to him uh, joining with me. I'll, I'll throw another one at you. This one's going to perplex you. Uh, if you'll turn with me, Edward, to Matthew chapter 27. Now, again, uh, one thing I appreciate about Alvin is he doesn't teach these things as a know-it-all. He doesn't. One thing I, I know I was uh, bragging with Brother uh, Reese Maggard. We were talking about how the beauty of the conference was that nobody uh, was really trying to one up each other or be a better preacher, so to speak. Uh, rather, it was brothers and you know, getting together and enhancing each other's understanding. And um, I, I really appreciate that. And Alvin really demonstrated that to me because he brought up such beautiful insights. But the way he was saying them, like, this is what he does in his living room. You know, for me, I'm sitting there and like my mind's blown. I was like, how did you come across that amazing truth? We need to give this man a microphone, you know, and yet he's just having casual conversation. He's just sitting there and saying, you know, these are things that I'm being blessed by. These are things I'm pondering. So this one's interesting to me in Matthew 27. Now, this is how I'll tell you how I'm teaching you my style. Go to the text, outline it. Alvin literally turned around to me and said this. So what do you think about Cornelius being the, man, the uh, centurion? Cornelius of Acts chapter 10 being the centurion who uh, made the acknowledgement at Christ's crucifixion. Huh. I don't know about that. So let's see. So here in Matthew chapter 27, if you look at verse 54. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, they became very frightened and said, truly, this was the son of God. And that's it. So that's all we know about this man. Now, if you go to Acts chapter 10. Here we see uh, now there was a certain man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort a devout man and one who feared God with all of his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. Let's stop there for a moment. Could that be because he was the centurion at the cross? That he saw, he saw this very thing happen, yeah. this situation where he's a Gentile who's acknowledging, whoa, there's some power to this, uh, this Jewish stuff. You see, he's, he, so, yeah. you know, but then notice he's going to have the gospel preached to him. If you notice, uh, so he has this vision, Cornelius, uh, what is it, my Lord? Verse four, uh, your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He's staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. So they depart. I'm going to fast forward. Many of us know this story here where Peter has this vision and talks about this vision uh, that he, uh, he undergoes. And if you jump with me over to verse 22, and it says, and they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear a message from you. And so he invited them in and gave them lodging. And then uh, we see here, uh, and then the next day, verse 23 continued, uh, he rose and went out with them, and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day, he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. And when it came about that Peter entered, Cornelius met him, fell at his feet and worshiped him. Peter said, stand up. I to him just a man. And he talked with him, entered and found many people assembled. And they said to him, you yourselves know it is inappropriate for a Jew to associate with a foreigner or visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. That is why I came without objection when I was sent for. And so and I, so I ask, for what reason have you sent for us? And then Cornelius explains his prayer or his vision. 
And then long story short, these people repent, are baptized and become believers. You know, this is a church here in Caesarea uh, that it ultimately starts. So again, Alvin highlighted an interesting point for me, and I'll tell you what the application of this was. He said, what if Cornelius is that centurion in Matthew 27? And what if just knowing the history of the Jews and just knowing the history of the, the, uh, of the crucified Messiah, if you will, what if that's not the gospel, which me and you would agree it's not? What if that's just knowing some history? So here you have, and what if that, you know, we know many people, Edward, I'm sure you do as well, um, that um, they know a lot about the church. They know a lot about the Bible. Mm -hmm. They're very smart people, good people, gracious people. But I don't know that I would call them my brethren in Christ. Uh, because they haven't acknowledged Jesus Christ in that fashion as Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. So uh, they haven't done the death to self. And the desire to, to be the body of Christ and, and to evangelize and to teach people the gospel. So me, for me, those are you know important aspects of a Christian life. So while these people can be like Cornelius or the centurion at the cross, they can know a lot. They could be good people. They could be giving alms. They still need the gospel preached to them. And then, of course, the contrast would be here. So as uh, Alvin had mentioned it, the centurion knew Jesus. Cornelius knew Christ. You see, that's the point that there's this the, the historical Jesus versus the Christ, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. And um, yeah, so I thought that was a really good point, a teaching point. And Alvin brought it up and I was like, wow, that's interesting stuff. And then I looked it up on Google, of course, you know, went to the Google machine. And uh, sure enough, there's other people that have led in on that study. So um, I encourage you to study it out. I don't know if there'll be more significance to that than we think. I just thought it was an interesting point something I had never noticed or contemplated in that regard. And one more I'll try on you and see what you think, Edward. What do you think of that so far? I think it's awesome um, how Cornelius knew Jesus by the uh, miraculous events that happened at the cross, but he didn't know Christ until the right. uh, gospel was preached to him. It makes sense, right? Yes. So now, again, this is a thought, as Alvin would want me to probably say, is that this is just a theory. This is not, you know, him doing Bible study or exegesis. It was just right. something that came together for him as he pondered it. He threw this one at me. Then he said, how about this? What if Saul was the rich young ruler? You remember when the rich young ruler comes up to Jesus and says, you know, what must I do to follow you? Because Saul knew about the Christian community. He, yes. what if he was the one that came up and said, remember what he says to uh Jesus, it's very similar to Paul's style. He came up to Jesus and he said, what must I do to follow you? And Jesus said, well, you know the laws. Why did Jesus say that? Because he was probably right. a Pharisee. So uh, he, he comes up to me, and says, you know the laws, you know, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. And then Jesus says, uh, the guy says, what, what did he respond? I, I, I've, uh, I've adhered to all of the, I've the done that. Right. And doesn't Paul say that a couple of times yeah. where he says, I was a Pharisee, I was blameless in the law. Pharisees so, of all Pharisees. Exactly. So you, now you see the comparisons. It's like, whoa, I never thought about that. That's an interesting point. Um, so again, you see where Saul knew the historical Jesus, but he didn't know the Christ. He, he right. needed to undergo that death to self, experience resurrection, and therefore came to know the Christ. So um, again, so you see the young, young rich ruler basically won't sell all that he has and leaves and you know wanders away, which selling all that he has, I think, our Western mind often has us thinking about monetary stuff, right? All his riches. What if it was that he was rich in, you know, and it could be he was rich because of his work in the law, you know, as a Pharisee. Uh, again, I don't want to lead too much in on that. I think it was more of a theory, just something interesting to ponder. But then, the, but then Paul did say something to the effect that all that he had had and gained was as done. It was done, done. right. Exactly. So, you know. Yeah, I don't and know. Then, and then you have the comparisons of the two sons. Remember the two sons where one son was told to do something and he said he'll do it and he did not. And the mm -hmm. other son said he would not do it, but then he had gone and done it. And Jesus said, which one was the faithful one or something right. of that nature. So that can also be corresponded with the uh, young witch ruler and Paul. Hmm. In a yeah, sense. Hey, you're right. You're right. Yeah, that's interesting stuff. Again, and that's what hanging out with Alvin Dixon will do to you. <laughs> 
So I'm hoping we'll get him on the program. He'll, he'll definitely be yes. definitely be a blessing to us in that regard. And then uh, I was referring to the selling of the riches. You know, I'm sorry. I was referring to selling of the riches. The first one said uh, he went he went away sad. Right. And then what Paul had done, you know, calling what he had uh, acquired is dumb. You know, he went and he did the mission of God, and you know. That's right. Yeah, yeah, I follow. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think again, there's some good correlations that you can you yeah. can come up with and kind of you know yeah. that happens. You, know, you start studying through it. So um, that's the Alvin Dixon. You know, hopefully we'll get him on here. Um, that's uh, just some of the insights that I was blessed by by hanging out with him and, and learning from him. And of course, I encourage you. Uh, you could go ahead visit the blog, go back and visit the uh, conference that we had and learn from him more directly in that regard. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, a couple more things. I want to find time to maybe unmute everyone and hear what they think, whether of some of the things that we've been mentioning or, of course, uh, some things that I'm going to mention or of anything that you want. But before I do that, I did want to mention that tonight, Jonathan Buttry is starting a new study. And I want to give you that information so you could go ahead and be a part of it. He's doing a study on Galatians. Now, Edward, uh, we won't be able to be there. Uh, hopefully, you'll be with us here at the Blue Point Bible Church uh, mm-hmm. for our Wednesday night Bible study. However, uh, tonight on the wooden podcast, uh, the wooden pulpit podcast that Jonathan Buttry hosts, uh, they're going to be studying through Paul's letter to the Galatians, uh, that will begin at, let's see what time here, 7 PM. So it says, come join with us on Wednesday, April 6th, 2022 at 7 PM Eastern for a study through Paul's letter to the Galatians. And there's the meeting ID for you, two, three, four. 632-8551. I'm going to read that one more time for everybody that's listening. The meeting ID will be 234-632-8551. And that will be with Jonathan Buttry and host in PBU, and I'm sure others that will be joining with him in that regard. Uh, Jonathan's going to be joining with us, matter of fact, on Friday at 7 p.m., we have a special program. I thought I had the graphic here. I went ahead and made some graphics uh, for the two programs that we have coming up, uh, particularly on Friday, Jonathan Buttry, 7 p.m. We're going to kind of have a post-conference interview. He was the host, so it's always to hear from their perspective. Uh, you know, did they have the conference go? Did it go according to what he envisioned in his mind? And ultimately, what is he hoping the outworking of the conference to be? And I went ahead, I don't know if you found time, Edward, I went ahead and listened to Embodying Resurrection, the sermon he preached this past Sunday at uh, PBU, at the Holston PBU Church, and uh, I was very much encouraged. I thought he leaned in on a text that I didn't include in my, my verses, uh, the book of Jonah. The whole book of Jonah is a, a, a text on resurrection, so um, that needs to be included in conversations. As we know, Jesus said, for the Son of Man will go uh, into the earth for three days and three nights, just, you know, to demonstrate the sign of Jonah to that generation. So uh, something that I think uh, is important. So go ahead, listen to that sermon by Jonathan Buttry, Embodying Resurrection. I actually shared it on my own personal Facebook page, as well as on the Power of Preterism Network's page. And uh, I know that you would uh, be encouraged by it and blessed by it. So, and then also the other graphic, uh, important to mention, is tomorrow at 11 a.m., we're going to have Steve Baisden joining with us. He's going to be talking with us about his debate with uh, Steve Whitsett, and uh, we'll, they'll, we'll ultimately be aiming at with that podcast is to talk about if we're going to see debates in the future and we're going to continue doing debates, uh, which I do think serve a good purpose, what are some healthy parameters, some healthy vetting that we need to set up? Uh, for debates to be healthy for us as the participants, as well as for us as the audience, uh, you know, to these debates. So uh, we're hoping that that would be a a very beneficial time tomorrow at 11 a.m. And uh, one last thought I'll bring up uh, that I want to hear some thought on. And by the way, uh, we're working on some future Bible studies. Many of you know, I used to do uh, knowledge nights where I've taught through my book, Wicked. I taught through the armor of God. We talked through quite a few different topics. Um, we're looking to start some Bible studies. If you're interested in any particular Bible studies, I might create a sort of poll that we'll be doing uh, maybe on Friday uh, in regards to different studies, which one stands out the most. I have three that I'm currently working on that I might want to present. That would be going through the resurrection texts that I brought up in my Rethinking the Resurrection conference uh, speech. 
Uh, also, I want to do a book study through Glenn Hill's book, Christianity's Great Dilemma. God willing, we'll have him join with us for some of that study. And then, of course, I also want to preach through the book of Revelation, uh, do a study through Revelation, uh, using the book I had written, Clarity and Revelation, using the resources I've mentioned, uh, Don Preston's uh, Who is This Babylon, and also the Spirit and Life Lectures 2018 commentary on the book of Revelation. So uh, a lot of resources and different websites that we might use, even speakers. We might welcome other speakers to come in on that study. So those are three that I'm thinking about, Resurrection, Glenn Hill's book, and Clarity and Revelation. So uh, if you have any others that come to mind, I'd be interested. Any Edward, do you have any others that come to mind for you? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, all right, those I, all sound I good. Know that, that last book I purchased would have any, uh, well, probably have some correlation, but I don't know if it's a great significance that we would use in the study, but that's the one that's uh, uh, identifying the last days or something like that, the last book I, I purchased. Yeah, I believe that was uh, Don Preston's book, uh, Identifying the Last Days. Um, uh, yeah, that was more pertaining to our conversation about Gog and Magog. Um, but yeah, again, yeah. That could be something we'd table for future discussion. I know Don had recommended it and said it was one of his best-selling books. So who knows? We could uh, we could definitely write that down and uh, make that something that we'll possibly want to do a study on. Um, identifying the last days, I'll put it here. That would be a book study. Let's see if that's something that, you know, again, my goal would be to create a sort of table of voting and see which one of those studies intrigues people the most and then move forward from there. Uh, and do that, start setting up some time. So, um, but before I get into all that, I wanted to mention one last thing. Uh, Fulfilled Magazine, I've mentioned it before here on the program. Uh, they just came out with their, their volume 17, the spring 2022 uh, copy, and they have a sort of feedback survey. So this is an important one, and I'm going to maybe type it up and hope for some feedback from others on social media. Maybe those of you that don't get Fulfilled Magazine, but participating in this might give you interest. Uh, I just want to go ahead and read through this real quickly and uh, let you hear some of the things that they do and some of the things that they're going to open up the opportunity to do and uh, see where some people might be interested. Now, what I'm talking about here is Fulfilled Magazine, exploring and proclaiming the good news of fulfilled prophecy and life in Christ. If you're interested in getting a copy for yourself, the best way you could do that is go to fulfilledmagazine.com. If you go to fulfilledmagazine.com, you'll get all the resources you need. Uh, you could also visit their major website that they use, fulfilledcg.com, and they have um, resources there that you can download. You can download past copies of uh, Fulfilled Magazine. You can sign up for the Fulfilled Magazine, and they have some videos. Many of you might be familiar with Brian Martin's ministry through the You've Got to Be Kidding Me video series uh, that you can find on YouTube and also in disc form. So uh, very influential, very blessed. Uh, however, here's what they, they are offering up right now, they, a review of a couple of the uh, resources they already provide in the magazine, and I'm going to read through them here, and they want everyone to vote on which ones they like the most, which ones they don't like at all. Perspectives. This column explores the different perspectives of the details of preterism. An issue may present one or more perspectives on a given topic. For example, in this one, perspectives was... Okay, well, in this one, they did not offer uh, the perspective. So I guess in each magazine, they take out and put in certain things. Gleanings from the past. This column presents excerpts from church fathers and older theologians that demonstrate threads of preterism throughout church history. Edward, you know, that leans in on a study we've been doing here at the Blue Point Bible Church. Objection overruled. Don K. Preston addresses common objections raised against the preterist view. In this magazine, he has... Uh, Damascus, an ancient city that falsifies preterism. Some have used that as a uh, argument against preterism. So Don gets in on that and shows that the objection is overruled. History of the end. Edward E. Stevens explores the history of the first century. And in this, episode, in this uh, one, he's talking about the man of lawlessness revealed uh, in Thessalonians there. Life in the kingdom. These articles apply preterism to our present day walk with Christ. Parting thoughts, T.J. Smith wraps up each issue with a potpourri of topics, a potpourri, sorry about that, potpourri of topics, including book reviews, word studies, interviews, etc. And he's currently going through his uh, most recent study about the descendants of Shem. And Preterism 101, these articles present the basics for preterism, preterism 
for readers who are new to the view. And that's what they currently offer. And that's what they want people's votes on. Uh, second thing they ask about would be, uh, they obviously offer up other potential columns. Uh, maybe I'll write one or think about one if somebody comes up with any ideas. Uh, please answer the following questions. Uh, I would like to see more introduction to preterism type articles. I would like to read testimonials from other readers on how they came to preterism. I would like to read testimonials from preterist churches and Bible studies. Uh, then he asks, what type of articles have been most beneficial to you? And last question would be, do you have comments that you'd like for them to consider uh, as they go about their effort of Fulfilled Magazine? So um, again, that's one reason for you to get your hands on a copy. Some of the things I told you about, you could make your, you could uh, count your vote in. Uh, and then also, um, I might hand that out at the church this week and get everybody to uh, participate. So um, Fulfilled Magazine, get your hands on it. I think it's a great resource. And of course, if you don't want to have a hard copy, you could just go over to the website, fulfilledmagazine.com. I'll share it on the Power of Preterism Network later today for everyone's uh, benefit. Anything you want to say, Edward, before I go ahead and start unmuting some mics? Just that the columns that you had had on, on the topics, you know, I thought that they were very good topics. You know, all yeah. Of yeah, they do a good job. I'll tell you, Fulfilled Magazine, Brian Martin does a great job. Him and his staff, they do a great job at what they're doing there with the magazine. So um, good topics, good stuff. I think I was featured in there one time talking about Reformation uh, and Don Preston's regularly in there as well. So um, just let everyone know, Alvin Dixon was not able to join with us live. However, he did watch the program on social media. Uh, I see a quick comment from him that I'll just bring up since we talked a bit about him. Uh, he said, Paul would not have known sin except the comment had said, though th thou shall not covet which wasn't asked of him by Jesus in the first question. They was trying to claim the glory of God. I think he's leading in on the point that um, where Jesus says uh, that Paul basically wouldn't have known sin unless the law told him that he was, you know, that he was a sinner. So uh, Paul seems to, again, fit that rich man, that rich young ruler uh, uh, picture there. So, yes. I'm going to go ahead and unmute some mics. I see Richard I asked a question um, about the appealing of the gospel to the Gentiles. I unmuted mics if anybody wants to chime in here. Uh, Richard asks, if time permits, address what made the gospel so appealing to the Gentiles. What made the gospel appealing to the Gentiles? Well, I would imagine the loosening of the traditions. Um, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't think that, I, I think I probably believe in election. I don't know where you would stand, Richard, in regards to election. I believe the gospel becomes appealing to those that it's intended to become appealing, appealing to, which is the work of the spirit of God. Um, and then of course I do see the, you know, the mention of grace, uh, calling many to the Lord in the first century. Um, the people of God living out the, the, you know, if we were to use Deuteronomy 4, that's a text I regularly bring up. In Deuteronomy 4, the Lord says uh, the reason why he gave Israel the laws and statutes. Uh, so the first thing is, I guess I would say the reason why people, things are appealing, the things of God are appealing to people is because the Lord does something. So the, what did the Lord do? He gave Israel laws and statutes so that the nations around them would look to them. And then what would they ask? They would ask, what, you know, what God is so near to his people that he would give them such wisdom and understanding. So I believe when the people of God live by the things of God that God did and enacted, in this case, covenant, and when they live by it, they cause the nations to see a present God, a near God, and they cause people to see wisdom and understanding that has come from that God that has been provided to people. That would be my answer. I don't know, Edward, you have a, a better yeah, way of explaining that? I would say that... Um... Being that God would have to give you the eyes and ears to understand, I would use Cornelius, being that we were speaking about him as an example. Um, when Jesus was crucified and the events that had occurred with the lightnings and thunderings and the shaking and things of this nature, Cornelius said that this is the, the, the son of God. Or however, um, he was able to see that when others were, were unable to see that. Mm -hmm. You know, through those appearances, you know, God had given him the eyes at that point. And then when he heard the gospel from Peter, you know, that, you know, first of all, he had that dream, you know, that God had spoken to him in a dream. 
And then, you know, he had that experience of the dream. He had the experience of hearing the gospel from Peter, you know, where he actually got to know the Christ at that point, you know, not just, you know, having that physical experience, you know, by hearing that the gospel, you know, the gospel actually touched his heart and that died. So that's, that's the example that I would give, you know, of yeah. what, what you're called and given the eyes to see and ears to hear. Amen. I, and again, I, I think it's, it is a work of the spirit. Um, I do think of, uh, there's a couple of places, for example, uh, here in the book of Acts, this is where we see the gospel going out to the Gentiles the most. Um, one text that I think of is uh, here with Lydia, right? We read in uh, Acts chapter 16, verse 14, a certain woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken of by Paul. So uh, that's one of the things I brought up in my debate with uh, Steve Baisden, who we actually have on the program tomorrow, um, where I, I believe that people, uh, the Lord does something that opens people's hearts and minds. I don't believe that, obviously we see in scripture, there were some Gentiles who did not have good reception to the things of God. And, and then the question becomes in that day, in our day, uh, why do some people respond? Why do not some people not? Why do some people get frustrated with the things of God? Why do some people, why do some people storm us out of the city with stones and rocks uh, and then other people embrace it? Uh, for me, it seems to be that the work of the Lord does something in the mind and heart of the individual that causes and calls them to him. And uh, that seems to be what is being revealed. Uh, another text I wanted to go to that I thought of was in Acts chapter 13. Um, in Acts 13, it says, uh, you know, they're speaking to the Jews. The Jews don't want to hear the gospel. Paul says in verse 46, and Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. Since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles for thus the Lord has commanded us. I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles that you should bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. Uh, and then uh, I actually have a cross reference there to 15.2. Um, different conversation. Uh, however, uh, again, what you see here is that there are Gentiles, not all the Gentiles, but those that were appointed to eternal life turned to the Lord and, and praised him. So um, I guess I would... I would believe it's the, my short answer, long, short answer there would be uh, the spirit, the work of God, election, the things God does in a man's mind and heart is what calls anyone, especially as we see here, the Gentiles, uh, to be appealed, to be, uh, I love what Shane Claiborne calls it, the irresistible revolution. Uh, John Calvin had called it irresistible grace. Well, Let's qualify that. John Calvin didn't call it irresistible grace. The teachings that have been built upon what John Calvin taught call it irresistible grace. And um, yeah. The good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel. I mean, you know, being a Gentile, hearing for the first time that you could have eternal life and the blessings that Jesus had uh, provided for us and having everything pertaining to life and godliness and things of this nature. We would not want to rejoice over something of, of such a magnitude. That's right. That's right. If I may say this, I see Vicky's unmuted. I'm going to let her have a moment here. Um, Alvin Dixon commented and said that uh, two things that he highlighted that I think are important to what we're saying here. Self-righteousness gets us all. Uh, what did you see with Saul, right? Saul was very self-righteous in that moment where if he is that rich young ruler, even if he's not, the rich young ruler was very self-righteous, had those scales of pride uh, over their eyes. And then he also mentioned uh, which I think is important. The gospel isn't a book of information. This isn't the gospel, right? This is a Bible. Uh, the gospel, uh, it's a thing of confirmation. It's the work in a mi man's mind and heart, in a woman's mind and heart. That's the gospel, the work of God, the confirmation, the death to self, the life of Christ living in an individual. That process, as um, Jonathan Buttery has been teaching it, the process of resurrection, which implies death. So uh, it was Scott Laughlin, matter of fact, at the conference that talked about in order for there to be a resurrection, there has to be a death. Uh, and, you know, and that's I think that's corporate as well as an individual reality. But the only death, as, as Scott Laughlin, matter of fact, had mentioned during his message, he said, the only individual death that we need to experience is baptism. And again, it, not necessarily water baptism, but uh, baptism of, you know, dying to ourselves and life in Christ. 
So that's the individual death and resurrection you need to be concerned with so that you might be a part of the corporate resurrection of God's people, the living, the dead, and the asleep. So uh, Alvin okay. wasn't with us, but again, I appreciate him and he watched and he's there in the comments. So I thank him. Vicki, you had something you want to share? Yes, I think election is necessary for salvation. Amen. And uh, I will give two examples in the Bible. For example, Jesus has four step brothers. In other words, Jesus has two step brothers that they all live together. Two were converted, two become Christian. And Judas Iscariot was very near to Jesus. I am sure that one way or another, he must have known that Jesus is God, but yet without the principle of election, he was um, he was the unrighteous one. And you know the ending of that Judas, he he killed himself. Mm -hmm. How was that? <laughs> yeah, well, I would agree with your your, your story, your, your uh, highlights there. That you know, I, I think as you pointed out, and I hope I, I illustrated a bit before as well was that there's so many questions about those, for example, that were so close to Jesus. How can you be right in his midst, see the same things, hear the same things, yet disregard who he is? Um, and then, yeah. uh, obviously, as you're pointing out with Judas, you know, Judas being another one who clearly seemed to have known quite a bit. You know, this, this, what I think this leads in on is what Alvin Dixon brought up about the difference between knowing Jesus and or knowing the Christ. You know, the, the, you can know Jesus, you can know the historical Jesus, you can know the man that did wonders, but if you don't have the okay. spirit that leads you to understand the Christ, then yeah. don't, you know, then, then it's impossible to you. But, but of course, with Judas too, uh, uh, he was elected to be a traitor. <laughs> you have to consider that too. Right. We, we would say that uh, symbolic with what we read there about the vessels of wrath and vessels of mercy. Yes. Yeah. Right. Well said. That's a, a good conversation for another time. Uh, we're kind of at the end of the hour. I did I want to give uh, notice to what Richard had highlighted here. Um, the only problem that he has with election is that, you know, the, I'm sorry, this is probably a direct message, but uh, uh, either way, um, you know, some people do have issues with election. And uh, Richard, you make an interesting point there that elections are happening continuously. Again, how we would understand election and what God is saying through election and how that works in individuals' lives uh, and how it worked through the corporate people of God is a conversation we will have to table for another time. However, I'm willing to have it. I think it's a great discussion. We probably won't have it with Steve Baisden tomorrow <laughs> in the morning, considering that is not his view. And, um, you know, him and I have actually debated this topic out. Um, but again, I am speaking. Uh, one thing I will mention is I'm speaking about Sovereign Grace and uh, some of these details with Ward Fenley, uh, April 23rd and the 24th in Sullivan, Alabama. We'll be speaking at Prospect Baptist Church. Uh, actually, matter of fact, I might be able to go ahead and share a graphic with you quickly in regards to that conference. And I'll give some thought to uh, talking a bit about election and uh, some of those details. Uh, if you send me questions through Facebook or through email, uh, those are always very beneficial to me as they give me idea as to what people want, you know, things want to hear. I don't want to be talking to the wind. I want to talk to about things that people want to hear. So here you see I have on the screen for you conference and fellowship April 23rd and 24th. Prospect Baptist Church, and that's uh, 1570 Prospect Road, Sullivan, Alabama, 35586. Uh, that will be a Saturday and a Sunday, so we will start at 10, 10 a.m. each day. We'll have a lunch at 12 p.m. We're going to have a roundtable Q&A at 1.30 p.m., and of course, it's a free conference. Uh, we'll make sure that uh, if you're not able to be there, we'll do our very best to make sure it's all online, as many of you know. Uh, I try to coordinate that with anybody that I'm uh, that I know of is doing conferences. So uh, you can trust that that information will be available. So that's what I have, brother. I uh, thank you all for participating. Vicki, I thank you for your thoughts and highlighting the verses for us. And of course, Richard, I thank you for chiming in with some discussion. Zach, I thank you for being here. And I thank the host of you that are uh, with us online in our group chatting in the, uh, the comments there. I'm very encouraged by that. And I praise God that our effort has uh, 
been a blessing to many. So, Edward, any thoughts you want to say, brother, before I close this out in prayer? Last thought. No one knows what's going on in the mind of an individual. Mm. You know, a person can have be in that natural mindset to as they hear the gospel, but you don't know what they're hearing. They could be hearing what, what their uh, 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 pride is saying to them or something of a sort. You don't know what's going on in their mind. Are they hearing the word of God or are they hearing their own thoughts? You mm. know, so that's the thing, you know, you can't really judge a person just by them being present. You know? Amen. Well, I, you can't judge a person at all because I, I, I'll flip exactly. that. Uh, I sure. think an important sure. part of that is to flip that over and to realize that while there's some that seem like they're thinking through the things of God, they might be, you know, they might be listening to their pride. And then to flip that over, there's some that seem to us like they're listening to their pride when in reality they are hearing the things of God. So you know, it's, there's a caution. Uh, there's a caution that comes in all of that. And uh, let's be glad that we're saints in the hands of a loving God and uh, we can trust him and, and try, you know, not be the judge of another man's servant. Amen. Amen. Let's pray, brother. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather this morning. Uh, we thank you for the minds and hearts that are here tied together, Lord, uh, seeking discernment, seeking your wisdom, seeking to highlight the power of preterism, Lord, and to thank you for what you've provided to us. As your word tells us, and as the spirit confirms, you have given everything to us pertaining to life and godliness. And Lord, we thank you that you've provided the healing of the nations, not for something far off that we need to wait for, but for something that is happening right here in our midst. And we pray that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear, and that we would have hands to do so that we might continue doing your work with you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I thank you all for being here. And again, join us tomorrow. We have our special guest, Steve Baisden, talking about debates, healthy debates, unhealthy debates, and more. Go in peace. God bless. Thank you. God bless you. Brother. Thank you. Thank you.